if, if you get nothing else from this conversation, we should be fasting more and eating less often. Hey there. Welcome to Evolving Ageless, the podcast. This is the enlightened woman's antidote to aging. So welcome back. I am your host, Michelle Dreilich. And as you know, I am on a mission to absolutely change the way women age. And so I'm joined each week by experts in their field that are sharing the latest and greatest research, their findings within their own clinics and their expertise to help us live a life of vibrancy till our last breath, right? Making that second act of our life even better than the first. And so I am joined today by a wonderful guest that you're really gonna enjoy. Our topics are near and dear uh, to everyone that follows us. Uh, You've heard this before. This is Cynthia Thurlow. And welcome, Cynthia. It's so great to have you here today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's really my pleasure. Mm -hmm. And we are going to really riff on some really great uh, intermittent fasting topics, myths about aging, uh, menopause, perimenopause, uh, issues with that and how that affects our bodies, um, and then how we can, you know, get around that word biohack, but Mm -hmm. how we can actually work to optimize the dance of hormones that are going on within us so that we can enhance our strength and our, uh, our, our bodies and our minds and everything that goes along with that. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Cynthia though, because this is pretty impressive. Cynthia has done two TEDx talks, one on perimenopause and the other on intermittent fasting. She is widely recognized as an expert in both of those fields. She's an accomplished nurse practitioner as well. She has her own podcast that you should absolutely check out called the Everyday Wellness Podcast. And she, on top of all of that, is an author of a book called Primal Eating. And she's working on her second book right now. So there's so many ways of keeping busy and keeping people (laughs) informed of your great experience. Thank you so much. Yeah, lo- that was a wonderful introduction. Gives people some perspective about where my interests lie, which really unknowingly I kind of fell into women's health. I, I didn't anticipate uh, that that would be my focus, you know, at this point in my life, but it seems so natural. In fact, I oftentimes will tell people that it's other than being a mom, it's the thing that has felt most natural to me throughout my career. So, really a blessing. Let's jump in and talk a little bit about, first, let's start with perimenopause, because Uh I know it sounds like it's not a sexy topic, but (laughs) it's such a meaningful time in a woman's Mm -hmm. life. And I don't think we do it justice. I don't think women recognize when they're in perimenopause, first of all, Mm -hmm. they they just assume at 50, I'm going to go into menopause Mm -hmm. or start menopause or that one day of menopause, Mm -hmm. but they don't realize that everything that's going on and Mm -hmm. why it's so critical. So I would love to hear your perspective on it. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, I, I always very upfront tell people, I'm like, I trained at one of the leading, leading institutions in the, in the United States, if not the world. And we, no one ever talked to me about this transitional period. It was like, you get periods and then you don't, that, that was the whole kind of focus. And so we know that women typically late thirties, early forties, we five to seven years preceding menopause and the average woman you know, goes through menopause at 51. So that means a a good amount of us may go through in our forties. So, you know, be prepared. Don't, don't assume that, you know, you're going to be 55 or it's going to be later. So late thirties, early forties is where we're, you know, trying to transitioning. We're making this transition where our body, we are born with a finite amount of eggs. We're not like men and we don't make sperm every three days. Well, we don't make sperm anyway, but men you know, make new sperm every every couple of days, whereas we're born with the, the finite amount of eggs. So our egg quality is diminishing. Our eggs are old chronologically. And so, you know, we may not ovulate every month. Uh, we start to get this relative uh, imbalance between two key hormones, estrogen and progesterone. And as our ovaries are struggling to produce more progesterone, puts a little bit of a lag and a stress on our adrenal glands, which are absolutely necessary. We need our adrenals. And what typically happens is people will get this relative imbalance between estrogen and progesterone. And so estrogen 
predominates in the second half, of, sorry, first half of the menstrual cycle, progesterone in the second. And so you'll start seeing specific things that may occur. You may find your periods get heavier. And by this, I, I affectionately refer to it as the crime scene period. You would think to yourself, where did this come from? Like, I've got this down. I've been getting periods since I was a teenager. I know how many tampons I go through or how many menstrual cups I use or pads, et cetera. And then all of a sudden the game, it's like you're a teenager all over again. Right. Uh, so navigating heavier periods, you may gain weight. Uh, you may have sleep disturbances. You may feel bloated. All of a sudden your, your sleep quality really diminishes. You may have less of a sex drive. You may be more tired. Uh, and I just find, I call it the losing your inner goddess, but I feel like many women you know, they'll say like, I didn't do something different with my food. I didn't change um, the way I was working out. Uh, I don't understand why I'm now exercising harder and eating less and I'm gaining more weight. And so it's just a time where our body is making this transition to where our ovaries and our, our body is, is no longer in a position where it's fertile. We're no longer, we're transitioning this period of time where we're less likely to be procreating. And so I, I find that many women, it's, it's a, it's a, the, the better they take care of themselves, the easier this transition will be. And so mm -hmm. a lot of the work that I do is educating women about, you know, maybe in your teens, 20s and 30s, you know, beginning and middle 30s, you could get away with a crappy diet. You could get away with too much drinking. You could get away with not enough sleep and over exercising or too restrictive eating. This is a time when your body is telling you it is time to invest in you. That whole self-care piece that we yeah. may negate or we may feel is selfish or someone may tell us it's selfish. Uh, if we don't take care of our, ourselves, then we aren't going to have anything left to, to give to anyone else. And when I look at a lot of women that are making this transition, whether they're early, you know, early 40s, mid 40s, late 40s, early 50s, uh, some women look very haggard. And I don't think it's not, it, it's not that they don't want to take care of themselves. They just don't know how anymore or they've forgotten. Mm -hmm. And so this is when things like sleep quality become pristine. I always say we've got teenagers, you and I both have teenagers. We need as much sleep as they do, even though they think they're invincible. We need more high quality sleep. We need stress reduction strategies. We have to change the way we eat. You cannot eat crap and junk and think that you are going to maintain what you had before. You can't over, you can't over drink. I see a lot of women that you know, I, I don't want to pass judgment, but they use alcohol as a way of decompressing. They use alcohol as a stress reduction strategy. And it's not like it's one or two glasses. I mean, there are plenty of women that that come to me or have spoken to me you know, privately that will disclose, like I was drinking half a bottle or a bottle of wine every night, or I was having right. a lot of mixed drinks. And so it becomes a time when we really have to invest in ourselves. And I find the women that take the best care of themselves, and I'm not talking about having a private chef or having a personal trainer. I'm talking about the people that make the time to meditate that go to bed a little earlier, that start removing the inflammatory foods, that don't drink as often, uh, that maybe are a little more gentle to their bodies, meaning instead of doing CrossFit and no, no shame or shade to the CrossFit community, because I completely respect their athleticism, but we don't want to be driving more cortisol up. We want to be, again, being really conditioned to protecting our brains and to ensuring that our brain is not perceiving that we are, are putting more stress on our bodies. So that and you know combined with you know the nutritional piece that i kind of touched on but i just find that fasting or at least not snacking or not eating for you know 15 plus hours a day really makes a huge difference and I, there was mm -hmm. a study that i recently read it said the average american so average think about it, there are more people that do this than what than not average american is consuming uh sugary beverages or eating 17 to 20 times a day I can't even fathom that. Right, right. and just the process. <laughs> right. I mean, if you think about right. it, if you have sugary coffee drinks, and you know mm -hmm. you're snacking in between your meals, and maybe you're doing mini meals, and and they're having snacks after dinner, and so you know each time we're doing that, we're putting more stress to our bodies. So the things that start to happen in perimenopause that I haven't talked about, you know, in terms of physiologically with our bodies, um, so we get these these hormonal imbalances. We're more likely to have an underactive thyroid. Uh, we are more likely to be insulin resistant, which means it's going to be hard as heck to keep weight off. Yeah. Uh, we are more likely to, you know, if, if we're under a lot of stress, which there's no mom out there or woman out there at this stage in the game that is not dealing with stress. I mean, this year, 2020 has thrown us a loop and then some. Uh, but when we start thinking about the, the cumulative impact of stress on our gut integrity, we are more likely to deal with leaky gut. 
susceptibility mm. to infections, uh, which can also, you know, drive up food sensitivities. There's just a lot. So I, I always yeah. remind people when we find that that happy balance and it's different every day, it's all this equilibrium that we're trying to manage. When we find that happy balance, we will thrive. You know, we don't want to just survive perimenopause. We want to thrive in perimenopause. And so I just think there's lots of different ways that we can look at this. But yeah, that's the overhaul is that our, our reproductive capacity is starting to wane and wax which drives a lot of the symptoms that women experience. But the biggest pain point I see, and I know this is the same for your women as well, the weight gain. And I would say weight gain is a yep. symbol of an imbalance. Inflammaging, as we've touched on, uh, you know, that whole process of inflammation, you know, whether that's perceived or actual, you know, mm -hmm. one thing that I, I do like to reiterate is that, you know, our body is designed to have this fight or flight response. And this is, you know, back to ancestral health perspectives, when we were being chased by an, a rabid animal, you know, we got to flee. But in our, you know, very over harried, stressed existences, what we actually are experiencing, our body doesn't differentiate between traffic, you know, stressful traffic, you know, the, the crazy schedules that so many of us, uh, you know, we're, it's like we're on a hamster wheel, you know, we're dealing yep. with the kids and we're dealing with the homework. And now we're homeschooling because we're trying to fill in gaps and, you know, maybe a spouse is traveling or we've had an argument with a loved one and our body doesn't differentiate between that and, you know, the, the ancestral health perspective of being chased by a rabid animal. But if all day long, our body perceives that we're under this amount of stress, it's not, it's, it's assuming that we're not going to have food coming. So it's going to slow mm -hmm. everything down. It's going to pump up cortisol and cortisol, mm -hmm. although a very beneficial hormone is one that will put us into a fat storage mode, which is what we don't want to have going on. No, no. And what's fascinating to me is if you think about our lives, you know, when we're, you know, under, in our teens and, you know, we're very anabolic, we're building, mm -hmm. building, building, growing, growing, growing. And so that's probably the only other time in our life where mm -hmm. we're at an imbalance, mm -hmm. right? We are growing more than we are tearing down yeah. when we're really young. Then we hit our 20s. It's all about us. It's all mm -hmm. about, finding a career it's mm -hmm. you know settling into being an adult yeah then our 30s we find ourselves as women mm -hmm. usually starting a family yeah. and then it's net that from that moment forward it's almost not about you anymore mm -hmm. right so now it's your family mm -hmm. it's it's your extended family mm -hmm. it's doing the right thing society says you're supposed to do with your family mm -hmm. and you're in that zone in your 30s your career our forties, I think, is when we start to we start to feel the effects mm -hmm. of our thirties, yeah, right? Because absolutely. we there isn't a woman out there that has not burned the candle in the middle and on both ends in their thirties. Yeah. 30. yeah, and and so I think we start to feel that wind down, and we start that's the next phase of our life where we get that imbalance. Except mm -hmm. it's the opposite imbalance, right? Yeah. Than when we were kids. Absolutely, and and it's a time when just like we say our kids need little ones need to sleep 11 hours a day right isn't that what the, the research yeah, shows absolutely so that's because they're at an imbalance mm -hmm. and we find ourselves now at the same imbalance and i remember when i went into my OBGYN and said you know i i my periods are starting to space themselves out and mm -hmm. and when i do get them you're with a crime scene it's hilarious yeah no, no. yeah it's when i do get them i don't know where that came from mm -hmm. and and her answer was oh yeah you're circling the drain uh, i think we should just put you on birth control so i was like oh. ah, what you know and this is this is what happens every day right it, out it, there in the world thing i mean it really is we want to control our bodies but i i yeah. i completely am empathetic because i remember one of these crime scene period days it was like day one just happened to be seeing my gyn and she was like whoa you've got a really heavy period and we went through the oral contraceptives i'm gonna do an ablation or maybe we'll just take your uterus out and i was like yes i'm out this is not happening and, and the unfortunate thing is i have so many girlfriends who got so frustrated with they were anemic i mean they were really really having very heavy periods really common they just didn't want it they were like i'm too tired i can't i can't keep fighting this i don't want to deal with the nutrition piece i don't want to deal with the lifestyle piece i just want to yank it out and i said that is the condition response i mean this is what we have conditioned our patients to believe is that a pill is going to fix it and that we need to do a surgical intervention and, and let me be clear i'm sure there are people who legitimately need to have these things done but I, the vast majority of us do not and you know what that synthetic hormone does 
know, when they put you on the pill, you know, it, it, it's this disconnect between our brain and our ovaries, but it's not solving the problem. It doesn't mm-hmm. negate. I have a very good friend, in fact, one of my best friends from high school, she's a year older than me. And she told me she was still on the pill. And I said, first of all, it's a crime that you're on a pill at the age that we're at, first of all. Second of all, you realize that it's just masking symptoms. You probably are probably almost there. Uh, yes, right. Here. And I said, all, you're, all we're doing is we're trying to blunt a normal physiologic process in our bodies. Because the interesting thing, when I, when I did that first TED Talk, and this is a statistic that kind of startled me, um, in the year 1900, uh, the average age that, that women lived to, like life expectancy was like 47. Mm. So is oh it my a God. surprise, which you know was the age I was when I gave that TED Talk, is it any surprise that you know society focuses on children, rightfully so? Um, you know, when young women start menstruating, contraception, fertility, infertility, pregnancy, postpartum, and then someone somewhere along the lines, like it, there's, it's not a sexy topic to talk about the the waning years of fertility and then non fertility or menopause, but yet that's forty percent of our lifetime. Mm-hmm. And so it, it's frustrating slash humorous to me that the unsuper sexy topic is when where women really feel so profoundly unsupported. I mean, that is what yep. I hear. Like it almost brings tears to my eyes every day when I get DMs all over social media from women who are like, explain this to me. Like I just like no one's ever taken the time to explain anything. And I just don't even think the education of our healthcare providers, it's not a focus. It's like there seem like you just suddenly go from having a period to not having a period and nothing in between. And it couldn't be farther from the truth. Right. And this is a process that can last up to a decade, yeah. right? So if we think of it that way, 10 years of your life, you're winding down, you're in the process of being imbalanced. Mm-hmm. And, and so what I, what I, think is a big challenge in conventional medicine today is, as you mentioned, Mm -hmm. the, the, the assumption is that we all just want them to turn off these symptoms. It's almost like we, it's almost like my mother, when she had me, she was not awake, right? Like they would knock them out and take the baby. Right. Can you imagine? It's like you're a passive conduit to what what a hot mess. So, but the idea that that we want to be present during this period of time. We don't want to mask it Mm -hmm. because the symptoms, what I have experienced, and I would love to dive Mm -hmm. into this with you, the experience of the symptoms that Mm -hmm. you feel during these times are really, it's like clues Mm -hmm. to how drastic of your lifestyle Mm -hmm. is out of balance, right? So hot flashes. Mm -hmm. There are women that hot flash so intensely up to 50, a hundred a day can even fathom can easily be managed with lifestyle can Mm -hmm. easily be managed with nutrition, Mm -hmm. um, exercise. So, you know, let's talk about that Mm -hmm. because we control more of that than, than we think we do. Yes. Yes. And, and so I, anyone that's listening, I hope that, you know, you take away from this conversation that, that we do have, some things are without our control. Like, yes, eventually we are, our ovaries are going to not produce progesterone anymore. And we're going to make this transitional shift and it, and it will happen. And that's not a bad thing. It's not something to be fearful of, but I think that, you know, I always start with the sleep. Like I say, sleep is foundational to our health. You have to prioritize sleep and not just sleep, but high quality sleep. So right. cold, dark room, like my family, my boys and I, and my husband have just, uh, I beautifully acclimated to 65 degrees at night. It's a beautiful thing. Everyone actually sleeps better, but you need to be in a cold, dark room. And it may be that you wear an eye mask. Mm-hmm. I have this super sexy silk eye mask that I wear every night. And I'm stupefied at how sensitive I am to light now when I'm sleeping. Uh, so cold, dark room, make sure you've got a sleep ritual dialed in. That means getting off electronics. That means, you know, the, the, you know, shutting your electronics off at night. Sometimes people keep their phone next to their bed. And I know for myself, not only is it disturbing, uh, you know, from the perspective of notifications, but also the fact that you're getting this, EM, you're getting radiation exposure. And so, you know, turning off your Wi-Fi at night, we know that, you know, radiation exposure dysregulates cortisol to wake us up. And so mm-hmm. sometimes as simple as turning off your Wi-Fi router at night, even mm-hmm. if it's for five or six hours, which I know the bane of the existence to my teenagers, but you know, that's life. I just tell them I'm protecting them from, their, from themselves. So we always start with sleep. 
there's all sorts of strategies around sleep that I think can be beneficial. And I'm not a fan of people taking melatonin every night. I was asked that I've been asked that multiple times recently. Melatonin is a hormone that our body makes, you know, synergistically it's, it's secreted from the penile gland. There's also conversion of serotonin into melatonin in the gut. Super, super important that our body doesn't think that we don't need to do that on its own. So if it's every once in a while, not a big deal, but not something you want to do every night. Uh, lots of things that can be very beneficial for sleep. I always, you know, focus on things like L-theanine. Uh, that's an amino yeah. acid, super yeah. easy. It's not addictive. Things like nope. magnesium. Um, you can spray magnesium on your bodies. You know, my past life as a nurse practitioner, I worked for 16 years in cardiology. I got really savvy with magnesium. And so some of the tips I used to use with my patients in cardiology, I use with my ladies now. And so um, really good quality brand. I'm not affiliated with it. Ancient Minerals, you can buy it on Amazon. They have flakes, they have spray, they have oil. Uh, that can be hugely beneficial. So really simple in terms of that or, you know, having a, a non-caffeinated tea. You know, sometimes people like the ritual of something warm before bed. And if it doesn't, you know, cause you to wake up in the middle of the night to urinate, that's, I'm all for it. Mm -hmm. I would sleep first. Um, another not so sexy topic is stress management. And I can't tell you enough how important this is. I was one of, I am one of those people. I look very calm on the outside, but I guess in the inside, I'm kind of a go, go, go type A person. When I started meditating and I do it at least once a day, if not twice, meditation has improved my sleep quality also helps manage. So you want to tap into the parasympathetic, the rest and repose side of our brains, really great way to do that. And it doesn't have to be for an hour. Mm -hmm. You can start with three or five minutes. I promise mm -hmm. you, if you struggle with, um, you know, getting in the right, literally in the right mindset. There's a product, um, again, not affiliated with it called Muse, M-U-S-E. You can buy it on Amazon. Love Muse, yeah. It's amazing. And I feel like that for so many people, you know, they can track the data. Everyone likes data. Mm -hmm. They can track the data and it helps reinforce if you're doing it well, you know, if you're literally in the right little mindset. bird chirping. Exactly. Yes, exactly. I was like, <laughs> I like to hear the birds. The birds are good. Um, I would say meditation but also mm -hmm. you're finding a hobby, something that brings you joy. And for mm -hmm. me, I, I genuinely love to exercise. So that for me is something that brings me a lot of joy, but, you know, finding a good book, connecting with a loved one, you know, nowadays, you know, all of us have been so socially distanced. We can still connect by Facebook. We have all these technological um, abilities to connect with people, plan a trip. And I'm crossing my fingers that will come to fruition yes, at right. some point. Uh, you know, walking your dogs. I mean, the joke in my neighborhood is I look like the crazy dog woman because I will walk my dogs anywhere from four to six miles a day. And I've just gotten very accustomed. I get out in the sunshine, which is so good for vitamin D synthesis, also really beneficial for the circadian rhythm, the distribution of cortisol throughout the day. Another thing that's really important for people to consider are inflammatory foods. Now, I, for myself, cured myself of an autoimmune condition nine years ago when I stopped eating gluten. So gluten right. was the first major elimination. And, and for a lot of people, they may say, I don't have a problem with gluten. Well, what I would recommend is that you mm -hmm. learn about how gluten or wheat and barley and rye are processed in the United States. Oftentimes it's the chemicals that are sprayed on these crops to make them less likely to, you know, uh, to mold or to, mm -hmm. um, to inadvertently, you know, get into a position where they're not, they're not usable. But we know that things like glyphosate can punch holes in the intestinal uh, wall in our intestinal walls and contribute to leaky gut. So you want to be really conscientious about that. Uh, I have had literally, I can count on one hand, the number of patients that after you've eliminated mm -hmm. gluten for a month, mm -hmm. right? <clears throat> Until you've eliminated gluten for one month, you can't say that you don't have a problem Correct. with it and get rid of it for at least a month and then eat a whole lot of it in one day. And you'll know if you have a problem with gluten. Yeah. And I can tell you, I literally have had five people mm -hmm. that have said, yeah, it was fine. Yeah. Yeah. No, and it's most people don't. They just, they just assume it's normal to be bloated. They just assume it's normal to have, you know, digestive issues. They just the brain fog, all right? of it. There's yeah. so many disparate issues with gluten. Yeah. I, I totally agree with you. I would say another big one, <clears throat> I call it the five pound dairy, but for a lot of women, dairy will add five pounds to your body, or maybe you've been eating dairy and then all of a sudden it stops working for you. I mean, I was raised mm -hmm. Italian. I, you know, in, in my thirties and forties, I would occasionally have, um, you know, maybe some raw milk cheese or occasionally add ice cream. Can't do it. Dairy is hugely inflammatory. We know that it, uh, impacts opiate receptors in our brains. And so, 
Uh, I, I, I encourage people. I find dairy is probably the hardest thing for people to eliminate. But when they do, I mean, I had a woman tell me, she's like, I lost 10 pounds getting rid of dairy. She was, that's easy. <laughs> she's that's like, that's a trigger for me too. Yeah, plenty. yeah, absolutely. And I didn't believe it. It was the thing like gluten, fine, I'll get rid of it. Mm -hmm. Dairy, really? Cheese? I, I don't know. know. You know, know, like, but it, I can, I, I, I feel completely different when I'm not eating dairy. And I, I and I can't say that I'm 100% compliant with it, but I know that I feel so much better yeah, without it. Absolutely. Um, that's absolutely. great. So that's a great trick also. I know that when I'm eating less, so, you know, I vesely in keto, primal, mm -hmm. keto, primal. Mm -hmm. And when I'm in keto, I don't get hot flashes at all. Yeah. None of them. Like they, and I've gone from, having the typical hot flashing that I think is really prominent in mm -hmm. perimenopause to turning it completely off. So, yeah. I mean, things like that, they're absolutely, way alcohol, I think is one of the well, I, things I, that yeah. fires off hot flashes. It crazy. definitely does. And it also impacts sleep quality in a very negative way. And totally. so me, I had to laugh during social distancing. I didn't have one drink of alcohol, not one. And my husband right. thought it was hilarious. And I said, well, we're not, I usually, I will have a drink if I go out with friends or other couples or we're at a party. Otherwise I just don't sit at home and drink. And mm -hmm. so I, I know there are many people who are the opposite of that, but, um, right. I, sure enough, you know, we went through phase one here in Washington, DC, went to a friend's house, uh, and had a gla two glasses of wine. And sure enough, I woke up that night, hot flashing and had terrible sleep. So Alcohol can be hugely inflammatory, especially if you're consuming it every day. And if you're trying to lose weight, mm -hmm. take it to the curb. I mean, do it's it sparingly. So Not worth it. It dysregulates our our sugar, our blood sugar, and and that can be a problem. You know, grains are another thing. I, I know this triggers people because they feel like if they take care of gluten, then they don't have to worry about the grains. But when I'm really trying to clean up someone's diet, I almost always do a grain elimination just to see. And there's a really great book called Wired to Eat by Rob Wolf. Yeah. For anyone, for anyone who likes to argue with me about the grains piece, I just say, okay, bioindividuality rules. For everyone listening, every single one of us are a little bit different. But that book usually gets people to come around to what I'm saying. You get a glucometer and you're checking your blood sugar. That's how I determined I didn't tolerate rice. And, yes, that's his uh, story too, right? Is that his wife could eat rice yep. and that he couldn't. And right. so that's the bioindividuality of mm -hmm. what effects do these grains have on your yep. blood glucose? Absolutely. Um, or different grains, beans, all of those things. And, yeah. and the only way to just, it's a very nerdy book, right? It is, it is a nerdy book. It's, it's like book. Get, a, get a glucose monitor and start checking yourself after weighing your food and eating it. But you know, it's, it's a little bit of torture for maybe a week, mm -hmm. but the information you get from it right. is absolutely priceless. Mm -hmm. Obviously processed sugars, let's be real. If it's, you know, the processed food industry is uh, out to garner sales. They want to make things highly addictive. And, you know, we use the term hyperphagic so that you want to keep eating it over and over and over mm -hmm. again. And so those kinds of foods, you know, when you're really trying to clean things up, I always say like whole 30s easy in, in terms of uh, you know, if you want to follow lots of recipes, there's lots of information, but a whole 30 is a good way. And, you know, the other thing that I, I encourage people to be really cognizant of is reading food labels because there's soy in everything. There's corn in everything. Corn is a grain, uh, soy is garbage. Uh, and so, um, you know, it, it's really getting acclimated to reading food labels and, you know, the other piece of that is, is, you know, we take the bioindividuality piece and some people are sensitive to nightshades. Some people are sensitive to oxalates. And so I always say, you know, pull out the big ones and then you can fine tune, mm -hmm. but histamine, sulfites, like the list goes mm -hmm. on and on. But when you, the closer you eat to the earth, yeah. the less likely you're, you're getting an abundance of any one right. of those things. So right. I agree with you on that. So the correlation or the, or the way we tie this in so nicely to intermittent fasting mm -hmm. is we've kind of talked through the idea that, you know, lifestyle can change things Correct. and have a huge impact on, on the, the drastic mm -hmm. uh, symptoms and imbalance that can happen during perimenopause. You can manage it with lifestyle. But I always love this topic of intermittent fasting because, mm -hmm. frankly, I've been doing it for over a decade, right? Mm -hmm. Like, it's something that I, in nutrition, we've kind of been into for a while. And, uh, and when I was doing it, even people that were, you know, so many doctors were saying, you're going to slow down your metabolism. Oh, I know. You're going to 
<laughs> right? And it was like, but but I don't, but I'm not hungry when I wake right. up. Right. You need to eat breakfast. It's the most important meal nope. of the day. And you know, when you said most people eat 17 meals a day or or snacks a day, mm -hmm. it's because we were conditioned to eat breakfast, snack, lunch, snack, dinner, snack. Right. And and so then we started trailing off that trail mm -hmm. and grazing is better. You know, the 90s were all about grazing. That's horrible. That's yeah, it. our insulin was up all mm -hmm. day long. Mm -hmm. And people so, are wondering why they can't lose weight. And so you know, for me, uh, you know, I was always that kid who didn't like to eat breakfast and my mom was a nurse. And so she was always trying to shove something down my throat and I would eat something small just to appease her. And, and what's interesting is my 12 year old is the same way. He doesn't want to eat when he first gets up, he will eat around 10 or 11. And so then of course, people always ask me, oh my gosh, are you, you know, encouraging your 12 year old to fast? And I said, no, but I encourage my children to eat when they're hungry. Listen so, to their body, right? So listen to their bodies because we're so disconnected from our bodies. But yes, I, I think if if you get nothing else from this conversation, we should be fasting more and eating less often. I, I yeah. you know, and if you're, you know, if you let's say maybe you do intermittent fast, uh, you know, you've gotten your macros right, your protein, fat, and carbohydrates. If you're not hungry for three or four hours at a minimum, like you should not be hungry an hour or two later. If you are. Next time you need to bump up the protein and or bump up the, you know, whatever fat portions you have. And, you know, one thing I didn't touch on, but I think is important, again, not a super sexy topic, you know, ladies, if you're in perimenopause, this is and menopause, you cannot just eat whatever carbohydrate you want. I mean, obviously we want you to eat, um, yeah. we definitely want you to eat high quality carbs, but this is not the time to go overboard with tropical fruits or copious amounts of grains or gluten. You really need to focus on some real you know, whole food sources like sweet rather, potatoes, fruit veggies, quinoa, veg, like squash, lots yeah. of veggies, squashes. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. Low glycemic berries. And, and that's where I find, you know, most people, once they start listening to their bodies, they're like, well, when I cycle my carbs, I feel great. And so I, I always say some people tolerate really low carb and can do keto. Some people yep. cycle their carbs, but the point is like, we aren't many men. And therefore we can't eat the same way that the guys do. And I, I know for some people that upsets them and triggers them. But, you know, I think once you acquiesce to where you are in terms of what works for your body, people feel really good. Like I tell people, I never feel deprived um, for full transparency. I'm gluten grains, dairy free, oxalate, low oxalate, because that's what works for my body. Um, but I, I mean, I feel good. I have to cook most of my vegetables. I can't do a lot of raw vegetables right now. Uh, but I'm okay with that. I don't feel deprived. I always say, don't worry so about me. many people can't tolerate raw veggies. Yeah. And, and in I, fact, for me, kale sets me over the edge. Like raw well, kale. Call it killer kale. For you. It's, yeah. yeah. It's full of oxygen. Always. Yes. Yeah. Right. Well, and kale is an interesting vegetable. We don't have to go off on the deep end. But but it, if, when it, wherever it's planted, it actually soaks up bad stuff out of the mm -hmm. earth. Right. And so it's kind of like a, a, a cleanup sponge. Yeah. yeah. So we need to be really careful with kale. I think, I think it became a superfood really mm -hmm. quick and it took off. And I think people started putting kale on everything they do, but um, you know, everything in moderation and kale Correct. is definitely one of those things. Correct. So, okay. So let's talk about intermittent fasting mm -hmm. in like in a bigger sense, right. Mm -hmm. or, 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 or so that people can really understand mm -hmm. exactly what we're talking about. Right. Because, you know, there are all different types of intermittent mm -hmm. or time windows of intermittent fasting. So let's start with like the easiest way to get started with intermittent fasting. I'm going to tell you the easiest way you skip your breakfast. So yeah. if you eat at six o'clock at night and you normally have breakfast at eight o'clock in the morning, you just don't eat breakfast. And it may be that your body takes longer to become fat adapted, which I will explain. It may take, it may take a little bit of longer. So maybe you're doing 14 hours a day or 15 hours and that's great. You're doing amazing things for your body. And I find that 16, eight, so 16 hours fasted with an eight hour feeding window is what most women do really well with. But, you know, here's, here's the reality. You know, it's like with most things in life, variety is the spice of life. So once you have been doing intermittent fasting for a period of time, and you know that you're fat adapted, which means that your body is using Fat is the primary fuel source, which is the way our bodies are designed to, to live as opposed to carbs, which, you know, sugar is a quick, you know, you, your body quickly uses that. Those are the people that, you know, they eat breakfast, they have an English muffin with butter on it and they're hungry an hour later. And it's yes. because it's, it's a, it's kind of like kindling on a fire. Sure. 
Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And so, you know, once someone becomes fat adapted, it could be four to six weeks for some people, that's when they can start adjusting time windows. But when you think about intermittent fasting, you give your body longer time to digest the food. Uh, your insulin levels are lower, which means the mental clarity. And for a lot of people, that is the surprising biggest benefit of intermittent fasting. In fact, I haven't eaten yet. And so I usually do <laughs> podcast in the morning and I won't eat until I'm done because I want to be like sharp and on it. Yep. Um, so you know, your insulin levels are lower, which means mental clarity is improved. You know, there's this really cool scientific term called autophagy that is only drawn upon uh, or activated when we're not eating. And so it, it's literally coming in and scavenging up these diseased and disordered cells. And, and given the COVID-19 situation, I remind people that it's important for our body to get rid of the, it's like taking out the garbage. You know, we want to get rid of the garbage that our body doesn't need, but I've seen incredible things happen, not just about fat loss related to intermittent fasting, but people's blood pressure improves, their yes. physical markers, their blood sugars go down, their mm -hmm. cholesterol panels improve, their triglycerides, you know, are improved upon. And so there's just many, many improvements. You know, there's, there's research suggesting it, it decreases our likelihood of developing uh, neurologic disorders like Parkinson's. It decreases our likelihood of developing type three, all type three diabetes, which is Alzheimer's. And let's be clear, women's risk of Alzheimer's goes up exponentially as we head into menopause. I think likely related to the degree of insulin resistance that many of us experience. So absolutely. Um, yes. Type so, 3 diabetes. We've actually talked about that mm -hmm. with Dr. Gina Pritchard. And one of the best pieces of advice I've ever heard is because everybody has a lipid panel. Everybody. Yep. Yep. Go look at your triglyceride to HDL ratio. Yep. And if that thing is over two, and it depends on, on ethnicity and things like that, but you know your goal is less than two. Yep. Um, and if your triglycerides are, are more than double your HDL, HDL um, you're likely either eating way too many carbs mm -hmm. or you, or you've yo-yo dieted in an unhealthy way to the point that now your body is kind of tone deaf to insulin. So yeah. those are, that's a, just a quick and dirty. I love that piece of advice. Mm -hmm. And I always give that out to people that want to know if they really could be insulin resistant. So that's a good one. Uh, that's a good moniker. It's interesting. I had a woman yesterday who was insisting she had gained 10 pounds during COVID, wasn't doing anything differently, looked at her labs. And I said, your triglycerides are 175. Ah! And so I said, right. you can't tell me you're not eating carbs and here's why. And so we had this whole lengthy explanation and her response to me was, what's yours? And I said, 50, but right. I said, that's, that's me. But I said, it gives you a barometer. Like clearly there's something we need to do differently. Like sometimes that's when that objective information, like you mentioned, that ratio, or even just looking at triglycerides, because your body will try to fill up the glycogen stores and your skeletal muscles and your liver first, and you produce triglycerides after. Like it's just there's right. all this circulating um, glucose that your body is trying to package up. So right. yeah, I mean, it, those are those are the, like the bigger benefits. But I find over time, what it really taps people into intermittent fasting that one of the biggest benefits is that people get connected with what true intrinsic hunger feels like they are able to uh, go about their day and say you know i've got to break my fast earlier today maybe i had a tough workout maybe i didn't get my macros on point the day before i'm going to break my fast earlier and i'm like that's great that's what you're supposed to do or you know you get lost in whatever you're doing like how many of us have had a lot of time to organize our houses and social distancing. And I'm like, it's midway through the afternoon. I realize I haven't eaten anything. And it isn't because I'm being restrictive. It's just, I literally, my body felt great and was fueled on those, those ketones. And so I was just kind of powered through my morning and my early afternoon. And I think the thought of getting started with intermittent fasting can be really scary for people that do have a higher carb intake because yeah. as you mentioned, that English muffin is like kindling on a fire. Mm -hmm. So you know, you eat that at eight and by 10, now you're rummaging through like, right. what can I eat that's healthy? Because right. I can't be ready to eat already. Right. And so it's that cycle of up and down. Mm -hmm. Once your insulin starts off on that course, you're just up and down all day. So I love the, so the intimidation factor of getting started, people think I could never skip breakfast, right? Mm -hmm. Which is fine. Then close up your eating window earlier in the day right so that your last meal if breakfast is your jam right and you want to have you know eggs and mm -hmm. and a nice big breakfast then have that in the morning but right. then eight hours later that's that's it for the day right. now these might feel advanced 16 8 actually is a is kind of an average i think for mm -hmm. like where you really start to reap some good benefits right. of fasting 
But if you feel in the audience, if you feel like you can't get there, start with 12. Well, that's what I was saying. You do you start with 30. 12 and slowly increase those hours. Right. And, and I find right. the more carb addicted you are, and it's a true addiction, the yes. longer it is going to take you to become fat adapted. So don't rush it. Like I have women in uh, one of my intermittent fasting groups right now. And there are a couple that are really struggling. And I'm like, listen, stop paying attention to what these three women are doing because you know, you're know you all at a different starting point. You really have to focus on what works for you. And I have some women, it may take them six weeks to get to 14 hours or 15 hours. And I run them, I'm like, slow and steady wins. This is not a race. Right, right. And, right. And you want it to be sustainable and you don't want to get to a point. The other thing that happens is pe some people push it too hard. Like they're like, okay, I want to do 18 hours and I'm going to do that right out. And then they overeat and then they're miserable because they're so full. And right. so I just remind, listen to your body. It may be that it takes you four to six weeks or even longer to really hit those, those water windows. But once you get there, it's like a, a duck to water. Like you're going to feel very comfortable. And if you know that you are seriously carb addicted, it's going to take longer. Like that's mm -hmm. sometimes an instance when there's really value working with someone that can coach you through that. If you feel like that's an, kind of an overwhelming, you know, concept to consider. Absolutely. And in fact, I know that you do a masterclass mm -hmm. on intermittent fasting. I do. Um, so I think that I know you, you only open it up a couple of times a year. So you're likely on a wait list right now, but mm -hmm. um, if you go to evolvingagelist.com in the show notes of this talk, you will find a link if you're interested in getting on mm -hmm. that intermittent fasting masterclass. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Because it, doesn't come natural to people that mm -hmm. have carbs, you know, that eat relatively frequently throughout the yeah. day or have um, certainly if you've got any kind of metabolic issues like mm -hmm. diabetes, it's harder to get used to that. And um, but, you know, it absolutely the literature is overwhelming and yes. we're learning more and more and more about the benefits of, you know, we talk about growth hormone and mm -hmm. you don't start to get good amounts of growth hormone when you're feeding yourself all the day. And, and if you think of it, it's really just giving your body a chance to focus on doing the cleanup crew. Right. You know, it's like if you had a party at your house every day of the week for a month, your house would never get clean. Right. It would always be tidy maybe, but in between mm. groups and groups of people coming through. The point with intermittent fasting is you have a party once a month, once a week, you clean up afterwards and then that's it. Everything stays nice and clean for a while. So give your body a chance to clean up its mess, mm -hmm. to digest and really, really absorb all the nutrients in the food instead mm -hmm. of rushing through because there's another pile of food coming in to upset the digestive process, right? right. So I love it. I think it's a phenomenal way. And it does have, I mean, the side effect obviously is weight loss. Mm -hmm. um, if you do start intermittent fasting and the scale's not moving and you're eating well in your feeding period and you're exercising, bing, 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 start looking at insulin resistance mm -hmm. and thyroid, right? Women, we've talked about this. I'm going to end kind of with this note, but mm -hmm. we've talked about this idea that what you and I are talking about right now is biohacking for women yeah. right but we don't call it biohacking because it doesn't resonate for women it's such a masculine 30 yeah. year old guy term mm -hmm. but we are so much more complex than men yes they can stop drinking beer and not eat pizza for a week and they'll lose 10 pounds it's true they're just uh, they're not as complex as we are so there are benefits to that and then there are some downsides to it and some of the downsides are when we hit perimenopause, mm -hmm. we start to really notice the effects of, of those imbalances. So, um, but I, I think this advice is tremendous. Uh, if you're interested in getting started with intermittent fasting, absolutely check out the intermittent fasting masterclass mm -hmm. uh, with Cynthia. And also don't forget Ageless Transformations is a program that has tremendous nutritional uh, uh, advice. Uh, nutrition plans, three different plans for you, including an intermittent fasting plan. Mm -hmm. um, so there are just lots of resources available to you, uh, but get started with something. Mm -hmm. So even if that means, right, we always talk about on Evolving Ageless that we're, we're in, we're in uh, transition always. Mm -hmm. you know, we're always evolving. And it doesn't mean you need to do 180. I'm getting rid of all grains, all dairy, mm -hmm. all everything. It doesn't have to be that way. 
Start with a 12 hour a day fast. Mm -hmm. Start with eliminating gluten or dairy. One, pick one, try it for a week, try it for a month. But we always say little hinges, right? Swing big doors. So just small mm -hmm. changes over time. Instead of two glasses of wine, try a half a glass and see what it mm -hmm. feels like. Mm -hmm. Just slowly try to evolve and you will notice you will absolutely change the traje trajectory of the way you age. It's completely in your control. Absolutely. You know, you can reverse age. And, and I, I think when I make that statement, sometimes people misunderstand it. It's not about trying to be 25 or 30. It's about trying to live your best life because we spend 40% of our lives in perimenopause and beyond. We want them to be good quality lives. And it, I think you touched on this in the beginning. When I think about what my grandmother, and I love, I adored my grandmothers. When I look at what my grandmothers look like in their 50s, you know, it's, it's, it's it kind of takes your breath away. You know, we've learned yeah. a lot about how women can live healthfully and, and still have really high quality lives throughout their lifetime. And, and so I'm grateful that you are one of the many, you know, wellness warriors that are out there that are spreading, you know, great and positive information to women as we're making these transitions. I love it. Well, Cynthia, thank you so much for taking time. I know you've got an incredibly busy practice and schedule, um, but the information that you share, it's just critical, I think, for women, especially women that are, you know, awakening to the idea that that we control this it's not our destiny to age the way our our grandparents and parents mm -hmm. aged so all right thank you i definitely check out uh evolving ageless check out the intermittent fasting masterclass your podcast mm -hmm. another one everyday wellness don't mm -hmm. miss out on that um it'd be great following both of us there's so many great pieces of yeah. information that you're going to learn uh so for now i want to thank you so much again thank for you. being here uh we are on a mission and we are absolutely going to change the way women age so uh consider yourself touched and consider yourself a part of this mission um i'm here every week next week i'll have uh even more information to share uh again so many pieces of the puzzle coming together through Evolving Ageless. So join me here again next week. And in the meantime, please continue living ageless. Bye for now.